How are you doing? Hi again, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Welcome, Omid. Thank you very much. Uh, super to have you. So you're the president of City Mapper. It's That's a household me. name in London, but for people coming from abroad, can you tell us a little bit what City Mapper? What do you guys do? What are you working on? Sure. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Thumbs up. Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, maybe I'll start. This is usually how I start these things. I, I ask how many people have heard of City Mapper before. Yeah. Okay. Wow. This is a home crowd. And how many people have the app on their phone? Okay, that's great. So I don't really have to explain it, but for the benefit <laughs> of people who didn't raise their hand, um, we are an urban mobility app that is trying to holistically answer the question, how do I get from A to B? How do we do this? We integrate all modes of transport, all brands of transport, uh, and what we then provide you with is real-time multimodal journey results, hopefully showing you some best ways to get around your city that you didn't even know about. Um, the second thing that we've started doing, and I'll, I'll use my phone for this, and I don't mean to be uh, rude while doing so, we've integrated um, payments into our application, and we've launched something called City Mapper Pass. And City Mapper Pass is essentially a subscription for transport. Uh, the current pass that I have right now is um, essentially uh, integrates all modes of transport in Zone One Two. I can use uh, TFL Zone One Two transport. I can use all the Red Santander bikes, unlimited, and I have 10 pounds credit for um, Get Taxi as well as Captain Cabs. So it's a mobility as a service solution that's on your phone that you can use to seamlessly just uh, have one subscription payment and that's it. Super Oyster. Super Oyster, if you want yeah, to call wow. it that. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. I need to get one of those. Yes, you should. So Uber, um, you know, mobility is obviously like a big space. Uber went public uh, a couple of months ago. And then the report started coming out that Uber is losing $3 billion a year. First question is, can you build a sustainable business for consumers in mobility uh, and be profitable? And the second question is, how do you compete with these giants? Yeah, good question. So number one, uh, Uber, you know, we, um, we did a lot of things until we ended up where we are right now. We actually ran a bus and got a, a license from TFL to run a bus. What we then did was, uh, we got frustrated with the bus, we ran a shared cab service in London. I uh, got a license from TFL to operate cabs. Uh, so I do know that margins as an operator in transport are relatively slim. So it's, it's a tricky one. And, and if you're, um, you know, you compare, or your, um, I guess USP is price, and the margins are slim, then it's get, it gets really tough to, to compete um, on the public markets, especially uh, there are two trends, and I'll just quickly dwell on this. Is one, cities are going to make uh, their, uh, their kind of, I guess, the smart city of the future more sustainable, transport more sustainable, which means, in, F, in essence, that we want to get rid of congestion and pollution, and we're going to price that into the, the cost of transport. And modes that are not really efficient in terms of road space will be paid for that. We'll pay for that. So we've seen taxes in New York that are gone on cab journeys that are essentially making cab journeys more expensive. What we're seeing on the other side, and this is very uh, recent, uh, California passed a law that uh, qualifies um, uh, the, the freelancers that are on these platforms as workers this week. Yep. Uh, it's gonna, probably going to go to the Supreme Court, but we'll see a little bit of a backlash against the gig economy. Uh, to make these jobs more sustainable for a lot of people. So I think this is going to really change the ride share economics, but hopefully it's going to make these companies, they're going to find a way through, but it's going to make them more sustainable companies as a whole for society and the city as such. For us, um, we look at the monetization in this space. We kind of got out of operating transport, and what we believe in is we want to be the foremost entry point or front end to transport demand in a city. You know, transport is a very big expenditure in everybody's share of wallet per month. And, you know, even having a small piece of that as a front end, and we're pretty dominant in some of the cities that we operate in right now, is, is great. Because what we can do is we can take that transport intent and we can pass that on to the operators. If we provide operators with traffic, they're willing to give us commercial deals. And we have a lot of win-win commercial partnerships with Get Taxi, with Uber, with some of the bike sharing companies, some of the kick scooter companies. So we try to be very holistic there. The one, and this is maybe something that I'm going to throw out there, is, a, is probably a more of a policy ask from my side, is like we provide a lot of value to public transport too. And as, as private transport is becoming more competitive in public transport and really is providing sometimes um, benefits that are shifting consumer behavior away from public transport, I think public transport has to become more competitive and actually uh, 
incentivize maybe uh, uh, it's uh, selling tickets for it a little bit more. And we see that in some cities popping up that they incentivize you know, selling tickets for public transport. We'd love to do deals with transport authorities on that side. The last opportunity I find personally is uh, the whole opportunity in mobility as a service. I don't like the term, uh, but I will use it because everybody knows what it is. Uh, and uh, that is making the complexity of various different transport uh, options very simple for me as a consumer, and I'm willing to pay a premium for that. Making my payments easy, making the usage of things easy. You can book a get cab in our app without losing, use, um, leaving our app, right? That's, that's, that makes it easy. Uh, we put it into the city mapper pass subscription. I don't have to think about the costs anymore, right? So these are things that ultimately make my usage of transport much more easy, and therefore I'm willing to pay uh, something on top. You know, I think Tel Aviv is probably the world capital of electric oh, scooters. Yeah, exactly. So I think you're preaching to who's, the... Who's used the scooter before? Okay. How many apps do you have? Like, how many of you have more than one app for scooters? Yeah, there you go. So is there, is there a room for city mapper to basically become the leading aggregator for yeah. all modes of transport? Like, is there a room for an aggregator to come yeah. in and consolidate? Yeah, so first of all, I, I'm going to take away the wind of people thinking, oh, yeah, competitive uh, Google, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't even think we need to be the leading, to be honest with you. I think we have to be one of the players that is dominant in this space because it's a trillion dollar industry globally, transport in general. So being, uh, I think we can be a leading player in the space. Uh, aggregating all modes of transport um, is going to be something that's going to be more and more important for cities. Amazing. So. If you look at the term mobility, it seems to be the buzzword for every venture capital fund. It's a yeah. huge trend. Uh, we're yeah. talking about smart cities, mobility. How do you see, you touched a little bit on this, but what do you see as the, the current like, trends in mobility? Like, are we all going to be uh, taking self-driving uh, flying taxis tomorrow? Like, yeah. what's, what are the trends today that you're seeing? So we're talking about today. Trends today, today first, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned venture capitalists. We see a lot of money having, having gone into uh, rideshare, electrification, automation, kick scooters, and bikes, right? So uh, I'd like to answer the question from a consumer perspective, though, because you know some of the VC trajectories are obviously long-term, and that doesn't have an impact on my life today. So I would say um, uh, what we're certainly seeing is more choice as consumers, which is uh, good and bad, because more choice creates also... Uh, um, uh, like a, a little bit of too many apps on my phone to a certain extent. So more choice is one thing. And the proliferation of first and last mile services that we see with kick scooters and bikes are going to be super important to solve a lot of the problems that we have in cities of tomorrow and today, as a matter of fact. So I really welcome this. And, and you know, uh, while you look at it right now and you may think, oh, man, these, are, uh, these kick scooters are littering all over the road and all that, it's like the first iteration of it. Every time there's a first iteration of something, humanity doesn't get it right, and we'll find a middle way that will work for cities down the line. But I think these... These uh, solutions are important as a whole. So we see a lot more, we see more modes, more private modes. Proliferation of private modes is the first trend. The second trend is more multimodality. You know, there, I think it's, it's commonplace in some cities now that people take like walk, then they go to a bike share a dock, pick a bike, then they go take a train, and then at the end, they maybe take a bike or a cab or whatever it is. By the way, you can use a city mapper because we have a multimodal router that gives you all those journeys. Um, but, you know, this is uh, going to be the reality for people in, in today's world, which wasn't thinkable five years ago. It just wasn't possible because transport was not digitized. It, these modes were not proliferated as much. So um, I think the second trend that I see massively right now is multimodality. And thirdly, from a consumer perspective, and if we touched upon it already, it's complexity, right? You have multiple apps. You have all these things. You need to look at various different things. There's search pricing on that. And then there's, like, no availability of this. And... Uh, uh, you know, the dock is full for that when you're trying to put it in. And then this is, uh, I don't know, the car share provider that you're using, the, the fuel gauge on that is very low. Um, we're trying to kind of uh, obviously make uh, all these things a lot more easier. And that's why we feel, I feel like we're addressing the trends. One, on, on the complexity side, on the multimodal side, as well as on the proliferation of all these different services. By being an aggregator, that's making it very easy for you to figure all this stuff out. And maybe the end game is not that there are like 10 scooter companies in Tel Aviv, but maybe just two, right? There's always going to be two. And still, if you have two scooter companies, two bike share companies, two cab companies, that's already six apps plus public transport. There is a need for somebody to doing a good job and putting this all together. I think that's the reality that we see. Yeah, right and case in point, you know, on transparency, like I, I, today I took, I love cycling and I took a line bike to get yep, here. Yep. Um, I get the, the ticket in the end and it was 12 pounds. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, 
if I knew that it's going to cost 12 pounds, maybe I would have taken a, a, an Uber or True. a cab. So yep. I think there, there is more need for transparency to like ease this complexity for consumers. You're right. So, uh, you know, as we're, we're looking into the future, yep. um, earlier today they showed a video of Guillaume, the city of the future in Saudi Arabia in the middle of the desert where transport is futuristic. Like, where do you see, how do you see this space evolving in the next five, ten years? Like, what's possible, what's going to be possible that's not being done today? Yeah. Um, I think the go-to answer is always, like, autonomous pods that take us from uh, door to door, which is, I, I think, not right and is silly um, at this point. Um, let me make a couple of assumptions by answering the question. The first one being that uh, we want to solve the problems in a sustainable fashion, right? And that we're talking, the second assumption, we're talking about mass transport. We're not talking about the 15 people that will take like vertical takeoff uh, electric uh, taxis that are flying through the, the, the air, because that's not going to be mass transport. We're going to talk about the stuff that's, that's real for most people. And I think if we look at that, um, the one thing, I mean, let me take a step back. The real problem that we're facing in cities is urbanization. Urbanization uh, usually happens in the outskirts of a city because people don't tend to move into the center of the city. They're getting more expensive as cities are evolving. What happens, though, is when people are moving into the outskirts of the city, the transport network in the outskirts of the city is usually not as densely populated or as useful as it is in the center of the cities. Right? So what we have as a trend right now is public transport authorities whose budgets are frozen are trying to figure out how to solve that. Why? Because what happens is um, when you look at Zone 1, 2 here in London, I'm going to take that example. Most of the journeys that are starting in Zone 1, 2 uh, are uh, public transport, walking, cycling. Uh, that's 80% of all journeys in Zone 1, 2 are that. If you go to Zone 5, right, what's going to happen is 60% of all journeys that start there are actually cars. Right? And these cars will end up polluting the center of the city. So what you need to really do is you need to move the transport from the center of the city to the outskirts, which means there are going to be holes in the center of the city, which private players have to fill. We're going to get used to cities, and this is, the, I think, one of the major trends, city centers being less car polluted and have a lot more walking and cycling. And, and that's ele gonna, electric. And yeah. electrified, for sure, for sure. Anything that is driving around there will be electrified. That's the first trend, I would say. The second trend is, I think, you know, the proliferation of a lot of private players in, these, in this space. Um, and one thing that is uh, a little bit awkward to me that I don't get is regulators let uh, private players come into the city and private players will think about the unit economics and those work best in dense environments, which is why they always go for the center, which is absurd because the center has enough transport. So you need to actually, as a regulator, decide to say, if you want to operate in the center, you also have to operate in the, in the auxiliary parts of my city. If they start doing that, then all of a sudden we have options in, in those uh, kind of outer parts. Now, what do you need to do? And this is the second trend that I also, or third trend rather, after um, more private players, is car ownership will become more expensive. Cities will start becoming more aggressive when it comes to road taxing, road pricing, uh, gasoline charges, and subsidies when it comes to electric usage of modes. Therefore, actually making it more compelling for people who currently think, you know, parking is so cheap and my gasoline car is so cheap to actually say, you know what, I should probably leave that at home and I'm going to take a first mile solution to a train station and take a train into the center of the city. So first we need to build the infrastructure and get that right, right? So authorities putting more transport in the outskirts, private players having transport in the outskirts, and then change the pricing dynamics to actually encourage people to do that. Otherwise, we'll be suffocating in pollution in the center of cities. I think these are going to be like some of the major trends. The last thing I would say that I think people are missing is think of the kick scooters of today as, as the Nokia 6110 uh, compared to an iPhone, right? I think the mass uh, vehicle that we will use in the future has not been invented yet. So I think kick scooters will evolve into that, or cars will devolve into that. You know, when you go to car shows, they show you all these like futuristic cars. Nobody's going to be driving those en masse. It may be like two, three people who have too much time. Um, but is the, the future pod or whatever that may be is not really shown off. And I think actually the kick scooter companies may come at it from the right angle rather than uh, maybe car companies who have to change their supply chains to actually go into that. So that's, uh, that's what I would say is another one. You leave us with a lot to think about. Omid Ashtari, City Mapper, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.